I'll hand it over to Josh and he can get started. Thank you. Uh, so it's good to be back. Um, I don't know why they got the soil fertility guy doing uh, economics, uh, but you know, hopefully at least you'll be entertained. We'll have a little fun, and if we're not careful, maybe you'll learn something. But we'll try and keep that from happening as best as we can. Uh, they asked me to talk about yield, profit, and environmental protection. Are these competing performance objectives? And this comes from the 4R approach, 4R uh, nutrient stewardship. We'll get to that a little bit later, but the 4Rs are the right rate in the right place at the right time from the right source, and your performance objective defines right. The right rate for environmental protection is very different from the right rate to maximize yield, and the right rate to maximize yield is very different from the right rate to maximize economic return. And so hopefully I'm gonna make that argument going through. Um, gonna, gonna do a little bit of math though, jumping right in. All right, and there's your slide. More is not better. All right. I stand <laughs> the law of diminishing returns. I always say I became a soil fertility specialist because it's easy. If someone has a problem, you just tell them to apply more. Fertility is easy. Just over apply and you'll maximize yield and then worry about disease and weeds and everything else. I know you're not allowed to do that in Maryland and Delaware. Uh, so that's why I'm here talking, I guess, right? So the diminishing returns. I'm going to try to explain this as best I can. We've got on the... Um, Ooh, what froze up? Uh, I done messed up with my fancy pointer. I made it through the whole last talk without messing up. So, <clears throat> grain yield in bushels per acre on the vertical axis, nitrogen rate on the horizontal axis in pounds per acre. Zero pounds per acre in this field gave me 80 bushels per acre of yield. Okay? So that's my base, what I'm getting out of the soil. Nitrogen, the organic matter, you're getting about 60 pounds of nitrogen per percentage of organic matter. Um, so maybe this is, you know, 2-3% organic matter soil. My first increment in this study was 40 pounds per acre of nitrogen. I got about 40 bushels and that gave me a return of $9.67. For the next 40 pounds of nitrogen, going up to 80, I just added 40 more, I didn't get 40 bushels, I got about 35. Another 40, and now I'm getting somewhere around 10 or 15 bushels for that next 40. For every unit increase, I'm getting less and less grain. At some point, I, had, I started out and I applied a pound of nitrogen, I got about 20 bushels. The last pound of nitrogen, if I go all the way up to 200 pounds per acre, the difference between 199 and 200 might be about a tenth of a bushel, right? That's a diminishing return function. And so as I go up, these white, light colored sections are the new yield I'm getting for that unit of nitrogen. So if we look at this figure, or excuse me, the gray is. So you got the dark gray with the base that I got with nothing. And then this is the unit increase in yield for that first 40 pounds of nitrogen. And here it is right there in the light color. And then this is what I got from the next 40. Then here's the previous 80 in that light color, and here's the next 40. And that little top bar just keeps getting smaller and smaller. And this last jump from 160 pounds per acre to 200 pounds per acre, I lost 47 cents. I gained yield, but I lost 47 cents because that last 40 pounds of nitrogen cost more than the grain was worth. Does that make sense to everyone? Because the rest of the next 50 minutes, this is all we're going to talk about is diminishing return functions. Well, that and derivatives. It's going to be a fun afternoon. Right about now, the lunch is setting in. Yeah, we're going to do a derivative. Um, all right, <clears throat> not the economic derivative, like actual calculus or algebra. I don't even know what kind of math it is. I'm a soil scientist. I don't know why they asked me to do this. So the fertilizer production function. Inputs, in this case we'll talk about nitrogen on the horizontal axis, yield on the vertical axis. Notice how that line curves right up. It's a quadratic formula that we're going to apply to this. We've got two lines here. One marches, marks the nitrogen rate for maximum profit. And that's different than the nitrogen rate for the maximum yield because of that diminishing return function. Often we model this function, as I said, as a quadratic. Y equals AX squared plus BX plus C. We'll get into how that all works in a minute, but basically none of this really matters. It's just to kill 50 minutes that we're talking about it. <laughs> that's a joke. It matters. Um, 
No, so you don't have to memorize, but it's important to kind of understand that we can apply different models, and this is the shape of that curve. And Y is yield, and X is the nitrogen rate. And if I plug in any nitrogen rate, I can get the yield at that point with the, if I know this function for my field. The y-intercept and the slope are very important. So again, grain yield, nitrogen rate. Now I've got a low yielding field and a high yielding field. And notice on the high yielding field, I'm getting about 70 bushels with no nitrogen. In the low yielding field, I'm getting about 50 bushels. And the slope is different. The slope is how much response I get. How many bushels do I get for each unit of nitrogen applied? And this one's got a little steeper slope. It goes up faster. Every 40 pounds I add, it goes up more bushels than that low yielding field. So maybe in the high yielding field, I'm getting 50 bushels for 40 pounds. In the low yielding field, maybe I'm getting 40 bushels for 40 pounds. So that's the slope. The change in Y, grain yield, for the change in X, nitrogen rate. So the change in Y over the change in X describes the slope of that line. So we can use this production function and we can solve for yield at a nitrogen rate or we can solve the other way, nitrogen rate for a specific yield. The maximum yield occurs when the slope of the line is zero. So change in Y over change in X is zero when it's flat. A slope of zero is a flat slope. A slope of one, right, goes straight up and down. Actually, no, that's infinity or whatever. One is, they're equal. You get equal change in Y for a change in X. So I'm not good at math. See what happens? Mm -hmm. uh, so we can solve for this maximum yield by figuring out when the slope is zero. So this is a simple, basic math, straight line. What we've got is nitrogen rate on the horizontal axis and nitrogen costs in dollars per acre on the vertical axis. And this is 45 cent nitrogen because the slope is 0.45. So for every unit increase in nitrogen rate, my cost per acre goes up 45 cents. So a straight line has an equation function of y equals mx plus b. b is where it crosses the y-intercept, in this case zero. Zero pounds per acre of nitrogen costs zero dollars per acre. So it's y equals 0.45x plus zero. x is that nitrogen rate, 0.45 is the slope, in this case the cost of the nitrogen per unit. So it's 45 cents per pound of nitrogen. This is a fertilizer production function. Here I've taken a production function for some data from Bob Craddockville. I've got three fields that I've averaged together. You can see all these dots are yields at those three fields from zero up to about 250 pounds per acre of nitrogen. I came up with the average response of those fields and this is my equation. Y equals A is negative 0.001 times X squared plus 0.554, that's at B, plus 114.091. So we gotta do a derivative to figure out where the slope is zero. So when you do a derivative, this is what we call the exponent, x squared. The two is the exponent, all right? And I take that exponent and multiply it times A, and I get 0 0.002, negative 0 0.002. 0 0.001 times two is 0 0.002. And I subtract one from that exponent. So now my exponent there is one. We don't write it in when it's one, that's just assumed. So there's a little one up there next to that X, but we never write it in. Here we do the same thing. Here we've got a one times 0.554 is 0.554. We subtract one from that. X to the power of zero means no more X. And then there's no X over here, so we drop the 114. That's a derivative. I only tell you this because tonight, if you come over to the bull on the beach, I'll be doing derivatives on cocktail napkins when I'm staring down at the bar. And if I don't have a cocktail napkin, I'll be scratching them in the bar with my pen knife because that's what I do. You think I'm kidding. Brian knows it's true. I was out at uh, a meeting last week at Case New Holland uh, with a bunch of my engineering friends. And um, I walk into the room. Well, I'll be honest. I walk into the hotel bar as soon as I got there because that's how everyone was meeting to go out to dinner. And I walk in. Oh, here's McGrath. And then literally they say, how long until he whips out his pocket notebook and starts drawing fake curves and asking us questions about the line equations on them and stuff. It's fun to do. You'll find out tonight. So now everyone knows how to do a derivative, and you can do them with me tonight. Um, <laughs> what's that? I'm not. I'm going to Kirby's. Uh, <laughs> the slope of a curved line changes at each point on the x-axis. So that slope... With the, with the linear line, it stayed the same, but it's very important to understand with a diminishing return function, that slope goes from high to low. So as the nitrogen rate goes up,
my yield increase is less and less for each unit. Does that make sense? Does, it, does this look like the diminishing return function we just had? So as X goes up, my yield increase per unit is going down. So the slope is going down. The change in yield per change in X, nitrogen. Change in yield per change in nitrogen gets smaller and smaller, and that's your slope. So when one unit, the photo, for, when we look at the fertilizer production function, here we've got that one with the high yield and the low yield, but now we're looking at yield value. We've multiplied the price of grain times the yield. So we're getting dollars per acre in grain, and this is nitrogen rate in pounds per acre. And when one unit of nitrogen only returns an equal value of grain, then we've hit the maximum return on nitrogen. That's our economic optimum nitrogen rate. A lot of people call it EONR. If nitrogen costs 45 cents per pound and grain costs $4.50 per bushel, then the point where one unit of nitrogen returns one-tenth a bushel of grain is our economic optimum, right? Because one-tenth of a bushel is worth 45 cents. That unit of nitrogen is 45 cents. So it's that change in Y over change in X gets smaller and smaller when my change in Y is one-tenth of a bushel at 45, 450 and 45 cent nitrogen I'm done. That's my economic optimum rate. So that's the same point when the slope of the production function equals the slope of the fertilizer cost. So remember my fertilizer cost was 0.45. My slope there. When these two slopes are the same, when this line is parallel to that dashed line right there, that flat line, then that's where I've hit that economic optimum. So maximum profit and maximum uh, yield nitrogen rates can be very different because, as we said, we take that derivative, the change in Y, the change in X, and set it equal to zero for max yield. But for max profit, it's when the change in Y over the change in X is equal to the price of X, nitrogen, over the price of Y, which is yield. Everybody following so far? The math hasn't gotten too crazy. It becomes more applied here in a second. Perhaps. Maybe not. We'll leave it up. I don't know. We'll let Brian decide. So we have this incremental response, right? But an important thing to remember that I think often gets lost in the weeds is it costs way more to be short than it costs to be too high. So when we think about, has anyone ever heard the term the invisible hand of the market, right? So the invisible hand of the market is like we do things and we don't know why we do them. But it's because we kind of converge on that economic optimum point. And we find that the invisible hand of the market across all regions, across all states, generally farmers are applying about 30 pounds per acre more than the exact economic optimum. And that's because before the season starts, until we harvest, if we have a nitrogen trial out, we don't know what the economic optimum is. So when we apply fertilizer, we have no idea what the right rate is for that field this year. We have no idea. And when we look at risk of being wrong, the risk of being on this side, if I go down, I'm losing over a dollar to go that way. If I'm 80 pounds short, I come up about three dollars short per acre. But if I'm 80 pounds high, I lose about a buck seventy. My penalty is greater if I'm short than if I put extra on, economically. And so the invisible hand of the market has pushed farmers to adjust to this risk that they didn't, I mean, they don't do, how many farmers that you work with do quadratic equations and derivatives and fill out the economic optimum rate? A lot, by yeah. a couple. Yeah. <laughs> they make them better in, in, in Carroll County, right? It's, it's, it's just, uh, so, <clears throat> but that, they don't even know why, but they're doing exactly what economists would predict they're doing. That's the invisible hand in the market. It always, it always boggles my mind. So the fertilizer production function for a high yield field and a low yield field. We've got two different equations here, two different fields. One's getting about 50 bushels with no nitrogen. One's getting about 70. Different slopes going up. But fertilizer price does have an effect on the right rate, but it's a nominal effect. At 30 cent nitrogen, so this is nitrogen cost in dollars per pound, and crop price in dollars per bushel, if we've got three dollar corn and 30 cent nitrogen, in this field the economic optimum was 188 pounds of nitrogen per acre. If crop prices went up 50 cents, the right rate jumped three pounds, right? Because that slope of that function is changing as crop price changes. So the more the grain's worth, 
the more nitrogen you should be applying. Because remember, the economic optimum is less than maximum yield. And as crop prices go up, we can afford a couple more units of nitrogen to get closer to that max yield. So low nitrogen cost and high crop price gives us the highest nitrogen rate, 200 pounds per acre of nitrogen. And we start to converge on max yield. Then max yield and max profit start to be the same rate. They get really close. This is how a diminishing return function works. If I stick with $3 corn, but nitrogen goes up to 60 cents, I have the lowest economic optimum nitrogen rate of 163 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So as nitrogen price goes up, the right rate drops down. And we see this also in the marketplace. If we look at fertilizer sales data, even though it's the highest nitrogen price, it's the ratio of these two things, what year did we have highest corn prices in, in my lifetime? 12, 13. And that was the highest sales year for nitrogen. Invisible hand of the market, pushing us to put more rate on because as crop price goes up, the right rate is higher. And in 2008, we had the highest nitrogen prices, right? We had almost a dollar nitrogen, and we saw sales drop off. The market corrected itself. However, all that being said, out in the Midwest, uh, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Wisconsin, Minnesota, they use what's called maximum return to nitrogen recommendation system. So they do on farm trials across, across, I'm spitting all over the place, across a bunch of farms, and the university puts all that data together, and they apply these curves, and then you go online and you say, what well, I've got my grain contracted for, what I paid for my nitrogen, and it tells you what the right nitrogen rate is based on this data set of performance. And they make a big deal and do a bunch of hand waving about how they're adjusting for nitrogen price. But the truth of the matter is, is that that ratio stays pretty consistent over time. When crop prices go up, nitrogen goes up. When nitrogen goes down, crop prices go down, particularly since we've tied the two markets through uh, the uh, petroleum fuel industry. And so, you know, really these little changes we see, your nitrogen rate tends, as that ratio stays constant, stays the same, 188, 188, 188. It might be a pound per acre difference that comes out by doing this economic analysis of nitrogen price shifts. Uh, but they make a big deal. We're adjusting for economics. There are tools like variable rate tools with sensors like the Green Seeker and stuff that some of those equations have you enter in price. And it's making a calculation on the fly based on price. So we can calculate the maximum and optimum nitrogen rate. Optimum economic standpoint, maximum yield standpoint. If we look at just that equation I gave for the high yield function, there it is, y equals 0 0.002, x squared plus 0.85x plus 70. Y is the yield in bushels per acre, X is the nitrogen rate. The maximum yield occurs when the slope of the line is zero and the slope is different at each point on the line, just as a reminder. And the slope at any point is equal to that first derivative of the function. That's why we did the derivative. So change in Y, change in yield over change in X, change in nitrogen rate. And so there's that first derivative. We've solved for the first derivative. I didn't make you guys do it. Set it equal to zero, you're welcome, is uh, negative 0.004x plus 0.85. X is 212 pounds of nitrogen per acre. That's going to give me my maximum yield for that high yielding field, 212 pounds per acre of nitrogen. I can do maximum profit for the same field. I'm going to use 450 grain and 45 cent nitrogen. That's high for both, but the ratio is 0.1, and that's about where we're at right now. It stays pretty constant. So set the price ratio equal to the slope of the production function. So again, I take that derivative. So it's the exact same derivative, 0.004x, negative 0.004x plus 0.85, but now I do 0.45 over 450. It's one-tenth. And I get 188 pounds of nitrogen. So what I do is I got 24 pounds more nitrogen to get a little bit more yield but I'm not paying for that 24 more pounds of nitrogen. So the right rate in this case, if my goal is economics, if my performance ob objective is economics, is 188. If it's yield, it's 212. Competing performance objectives, they're not the same. So what do you want in life is the question. So let's compare that max yield to max profit. So we do the max yield, and we figure out the nitrogen rate 
212, and I enter that back into the original function, and I get that that will give me a yield of about 160.3 bushels per acre. That was my max yield in that field. If I look at the max profit, remember it was 188 pounds of nitrogen per acre, gave me my max profit. I plug that number back into the X here, the original equation, and I got 159.1 bushels per acre. Now do you understand the diminishing return function? I had to apply 24 pounds of nitrogen to get four tenths of a bushel of grain, right, roughly. I couldn't pay for that 24 pounds of nitrogen with that last, that last shot wasn't going to get me enough grain to pay for that. So low yield potential production function, we can do that too. I, I didn't work this one all out step by step, but it's just a different equation. Same kind of approach. I'm going to set that first derivative equal to zero to get my max yield, and it's 167 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Same prices. My max economics occurs at 146 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So now I've dropped way off. My max yield is going to be at 167, but my max profit is only at 146 units of nitrogen. Economically optimum nitrate, as I said before, we generally don't have to worry too much about price because with normal grain to fertilizer price ratio range, it has a little effect on actual rate. In this case, they're using the opposite, so 10 is 0.1 and 15 is 0.15. They did corn price over fertilizer price. But you see that that low yield field and a high yield field, the actual economic optimum nitrogen rate on the vertical axis here, so this is nitrogen rate that is the optimum, if we plot that, for these different price ratios, notice that there's not much difference from the beginning of that range to the end of that range. So as the price range ratio fluctuates, you get very small shifts in what the actual economic rate is. But what if the fields are different? So forget fertilizer response or fertilizer price, and that's what the Midwest makes a big deal out of. Let's take that out of the equation. Let's talk about different soils. So if you go up to Minnesota, cold, deep, organic soils, Zero pounds of nitrogen, they can get 150, 200 bushels of grain, right? They're pumping all this organic matter that's stored up because of the type of soil that they've got. So that's that red line there, right? They got a higher y-intercept. Remember the y-intercept? So at zero, they're getting more yield. The slope's a little bit flatter in this example. We can get to the same place on our sandy soils, right? We can get the same yield as some of these fields, not all of them, but we can get to the same place but they just get there sooner. So their economic optimum nitrogen rate is much lower than ours, but to get to the same yield point. So field to field variability and year to year variability has a much greater impact on what the economic optimum nitrogen rate is than these small shifts in fertilizer price. But what we really want to talk about is this 4R approach in these performance objectives. Are these competing performance objectives? So the four R's are the right rate from the right source, the right time, and the right place. So maybe I use uh, UAN as my source. I'm side dressing uh, with a coulter rig down the middle of the row, so I'm knifing it in in season, so my timing is in season for most of my nitrogen. And so I'm using a lower rate because I'm being more efficient in the way I manage it with in season, knifed in, UAN. But what is that right rate? It is different, as we show, for net profit, for resource efficiency, for nutrient loss, or water quality. I mean, there's all kinds of performance objectives around here. Uh, yield, yield stability or yield quality, return on investment. Maximizing yield is different than net profit. So oftentimes, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about four R's, but the performance objective is actually more important than that R. The rate, time, place, and source that performance objective determines what right is. It's different for every different performance objective. Agronomically small nutrient loss are environmentally significant. How many people went to Chad Penn's talk earlier this morning on phosphorus filters? And this is a big point with what he was talking about. If you're applying 100 pounds of phosphate, P205 per acre, you've got low soil test P, you're putting 100 pounds per acre out there. How much do you really care about a half pound of P205 per acre loss? None. I don't even know. I don't miss it. Environmentally, that's a massive load. 
And that's what Chad's talking about catching. And I think a lot of time in the ag community, we don't realize that, like half pound, I'm doing pretty good. And you are, you're doing pretty good, right? <clears throat> you're losing a half pound. On the environmental side, folks go, well, I'm saving you money because you paid for that nitrogen and phosphorus, and if it goes in the Chesapeake Bay, you're losing money. <clears throat> Not true. I'm gonna show you some data in a second. Maximum profit is a competing performance objective with environmental protection. If my objective is to minimize environmental losses, I will make less money. I won't say that you will lose money. You may in some cases, depending on how extreme you go, but you will make less money, particularly when it comes to nitrogen, but even with phosphorus. Because with phosphorus, you may very well have to put in a $10,000 phosphorus filter that Chad described to treat 20 acres. You're gonna lose a bunch of money. You are not saving money by protecting water quality. Now, if I'm that farmer that is grossly over applying nitrogen, we do not have this in the mid-Atlantic, right? We'll talk about some state, no one's, anyone from Wisconsin? If I'm in Wisconsin and I'm applying 100 pounds per acre more nitrogen than my economic optimal nitrogen rate, then yes, I will save you money and make water quality better. But we still haven't hit the threshold of target water quality. Yes, you're better. You went from bad to better, but you haven't hit your target. And to hit the target for water quality, I am convinced you must make less money. And so don't be confused. The debate is not about whether or not we want clean water. I think everyone in the room, except for a few people, want clean water. I won't ask you to raise your hands. <clears throat> we all want clean water. The debate is about who pays. That's why we have EQIP, right? That's why we have state cost share programs because we say this is an external benefit. The farmer doesn't reap profit from the Chesapeake Bay. This is a public good, and so the public will pay for it, and different states handle that differently. Maryland invests a lot more money than other states do because they're right next to the bay, so they more acutely feel that public benefit. Does everyone understand? Okay. It's not an emotional issue. Some, I think in agriculture we haven't been transparent enough, and I understand why. If you start saying yes, I am contributing to the Chesapeake Bay problem. The next thing that happens is the regulations come. We've already got the regulations, right? So I think we should be transparent. To me, it's, you know, some people get tied up and they think, well, you're talking about my grandmom and apple pie when you talk about farmers contributing nutrients. My wife, wife will tell you, I'm incapable of emotional connection. She always says it's, says it's not funny and I shouldn't joke about it in extension talks. <laughs> she says it's not funny when it actually happens to you. Um, <clears throat> I don't care about apple pie. It's not my favorite pie. I'm just pointing out the facts. If we're going to meet environmental objectives, you're going to be less profitable with the current state of technology. But remember, we always have new technologies that come along, disruptive technologies. Our big increase in nitrogen use efficiency, we're way better now than we were 20 years ago. Again, I don't get hung up on meeting goals because I wonder sometimes if we'll meet them. My question always is, is, are we moving the ball forward? I was with a bunch of Canadians last week and they kept saying, are we moving the puck down the ice? I'm like, ah, puck, ice, I don't know. And you know, so it's like, are we moving the ball forward? Yes, and it's through technology, right? We're getting better yields, same nitrogen rate. There are significant trade-offs in managing for environmental production. The most profitable system will likely have significant environmental impact, competing performance objectives. We know that maximizing yield, if yield is your goal, that's not the same as maximum profit. You make less money when you maximize yield. Nonetheless, it is difficult, maybe impossible, to determine the optimum nitrogen rate for yield, profit, or environmental objectives. So if we look, you know, we can, we can wave our hands all we want about what's the different rate for yield versus profit versus water quality. We know these two are in competition. This is probably in competition. But I can't tell you what the yield is to get any one of those three objectives. So that's the other thing we need to be transparent about. There are shortcomings in our recommendation system. If anyone tells you that they can give you the right nitrogen rate, they are grossly over-exaggerating and perhaps not being perfectly honest with you. Because the nitrogen requirement is complex. Nitrogen requirement for max yield or any of these other objectives really 
is determined by nitrogen responsiveness, the slope of that line. How many units yield do I get for each unit of nitrogen? That's responsiveness. Nitrogen availability, that's nitrogen supply. That's that y-intercept. When I put zero pounds of nitrogen down, how much yield do I get? That's nitrogen availability. Where, what's my yield at zero rate? And potential yield. So that's that maximum of that line. There's three key parts. The top of the line, the bottom of the line, and the space in between. And we can't figure that out because all three of these things vary in space and time. The right rate here is different than the right rate over there. And for this field, the right rate is different this year than next year. And most of that's climate. They move independently, so they don't move in the same direction together. So they're very hard to predict precisely. Soil type, climate, previous management, those things vary in space and time, and they influence those three things independently. So I would argue nitrogen surpluses, that surplus nitrogen that gets into the inland bays or the groundwater or the Chesapeake Bay, exists due to the shortcomings of our recommendations and seasonal and spatial variability and requirement. Certainly there are people that apply beyond recommendation, and that is a contributing factor. I do not argue that that doesn't happen. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that life is a big bell curve. For whatever you want to talk about, it's a big bell curve, and I would think that most people are applying somewhere around the recommendations, and that's not good enough if we want clean water. That's what I'm saying. The guys out here that are applying way above recommendations, yeah, that's a problem. But we got folks down here way below recommendations, too. You got these tails on that curve. Maybe it's skewed right. I don't know. This is some work that Amy and I did in 2006, was it, Amy? It was a lifetime ago. I don't even remember 2006. <sighs> Life's been hard since then. Um, it's a bell curve. It's a bell curve. <laughs> Everything's a bell curve. I just sit around and make up curves. So here's pounds per acre per year of surplus nitrogen. This is for the state of Delaware. Pounds per acre, what we apply in surplus and time. In about 1998, they hired Dave Hansen and Greg Benford. And all of a sudden, nitrogen surpluses start going down because of Dave and Greg educating Delawareans. That's kind of a joke. <laughs> um, no, but a lot of it's education, but a lot of it's technology. We just got better at managing nutrients. If you yield more and you're applying about the same amount of nitrogen, nitrogen use efficiency goes up. So some of this is things we did, and some of it is just the way the world works. We got better at farming with the same amount of inputs. And so we, if we look at the blue line, that's surplus relative to recommendation from the University of Delaware. So we just did some real gross calculations. How much grain was produced in Delaware? How many watermelons? How many cantaloupes? What would the University of Delaware recommend for all that crop in the state? How far off are we? And we started at about 70 pounds too much and ended up about 30 pounds too much. And that includes total in from manure. And our recommendations aren't based on total in. They're based on plant available in, which is a little bit less. So that surplus is probably at that point actually down around 15 to 20, give or take, if we take that excess out. And what did I say? Stochastic risk assessment. All of a sudden, I start, I, we come up with this number, and then you start seeing things, right? Like, they say no one's out to get me, but I'm pretty sure they are. Because as soon as we come up with this number, all of a sudden, then I start seeing all these papers where 30 pounds surplus is the right rate. If the economic optimum rate is 160, 190 is what you should be applying to offset that risk of being too low. Remember how the penalty is more on this side than on this side? And economists have all this fancy math. You can call it magic and voodoo if you want. But they do all these fancy equations, and this is right about where the invisible hand of the market is going to put us. About 30 pounds more than the university recommendations. But what we're more interested in, so it looks like folks are doing what they're supposed to. They're basically following recommendation. Here's our problem. This is nitrogen inputs versus yield harvested nitrogen. How, what's the concentration of nitrogen in that grain, and how much grain did we haul off? Just checkbook balance. And see how it's going up and down? That's weather. In 2002, we had a dry year. We fertilized for 180 bushel corn. We got 60 bushels. The best thing for the Chesapeake Bay, the inland bays, and groundwater, irrigation, good weather. 
because then we can start to hone in on what the right rate is. That variability, that imprecision, our inability to find the right rate is what's killing us to a large extent. People talk about precision ag. This is accurate ag. This is what we do today. Regardless of what technology you bring on the farm, I would argue we're still here. We haven't gotten, maybe we gotta give up some accuracy to increase our precision. They have to recruit students to take statistics class at the University of Kentucky. I, I can't picture that. I, I don't know why. And they put these posters up in the hallway. And the way they cracked me up is there's these three professors and they're deer hunting. And the soil fertility specialist shoots and misses three feet to the left. The soil microbiologist shoots and misses three feet to the right. And the statistician jumps up and goes, got him. That's, that's accurate. That's accurate. On average, they hit the deer. And that's where we're at. Our recommendation systems in Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia are really good. If I put a nitrogen response trial in every one of your fields for the next 25 years, the average rate rate would be exactly what we tell you it is. Because we built our recommendation systems that way. It'd be a pound per bushel of expected yield plus or minus for the different coefficients. They're perfect, perfectly accurate. And so every year in every spot, we're wrong. We're chasing the right rate. But on average, we're somewhere in there. It gets worse for us, though. So here's the difference between accuracy and precision, right? So this is that same data that I showed you before. This is Bob Crowderville's data. Three different trials, hybrid trials with different nitrogen rates. This one here is pretty cool. Keatesville, 215 bushels, no nitrogen. We see that in about 40% of our research plots. But you have no way to know at the beginning of the season if you need nitrogen or not, right? But if we took these three, you know, so here we've got the Y and we've got Beltsville, they look about the same. If we take these three sites and we say this is the world and we're gonna make Maryland recommendations based off of this, we model it, we make a production function, it looks like this, there's my equation. These error bars, these lines are the error bars. Standard deviation is a measure of precision. Because of this guy up here, they got 215 bushels with no nitrogen. At the low end, we lack precision. But our precision gets a lot better at the high end. We'll see this in some other trials as well. But when you depend on the soil to supply your nitrogen, you can't trust the soil. And I say that as a soil scientist. You can't trust the bugs in the soil to give you what you need. And so our precision stinks down here where I'm getting a bunch of nitrogen from the soil. This field, I got it. These two, I did it. Up here, it was all fertilizer. So we converged on the same spot, right? But this kind of noise is in our recommendation systems, and this is why they're accurate, but imprecise. I mean, we would drop out that non-responsive site and probably go with an equation that looks like this and then look at our standard deviations. But even when we drop out the non-responsive site, see that error bar there? and you can't even see the error bars at all the other points. As we apply more nitrogen, my precision of predicting the right rate improves, the variability in yield goes down, and so to offset risk, I apply 30 pounds more than the economic optimum rate. It's the invisible hand of the market. You don't have farmers doing this research, and they're not doing derivatives and equations, but we kind of find the right rate for profitability. If we look at the three site average, we do the same math that we did before. Three site average, max yield occurs at 277 pounds per acre. Most profitable is 227, so about, what's that, 50 pound difference. 191 was the max yield. 188 was the most profitable. So I'm gonna take a three, what's that, about three bushel different hit, but I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna drop 50 pounds of nitrogen, so it's more profitable. 50 pounds of nitrogen isn't gonna pay for itself with just three bushels. Over here though, if I drop that wild site out that didn't need any nitrogen, right, and I just use my two low sites, I'm gonna be more precise. Now I've more precisely predicted that the max yield is uh, gonna occur at 163 bushels with 224 pounds per acre. The right rate's 199 pounds per acre to get 162. So I've dropped my nitrogen rate 25 pounds, but I've only lost a bushel. Diminishing return. Here, my prediction is more precise. They're both very accurate. This is the difference between accuracy and precision. It is accurate to say that the right rate is somewhere around 227 to 199 pounds per acre. But the 199 is more precise. 
So do you get the difference between precision and accuracy? So why does this matter when we talk about water quality? This is some data from Frank Cole, old data that he did with Jack Meisinger and folks. And we have nitrogen rate on the horizontal axis and yield on the vertical axis. And we've got this production function, right? <clears throat> and then we find the economic optimum rate. And it occurs right there around 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. But what they did was they took one meter soil samples after harvest. They looked at the nitrate in that top meter left after harvest, assuming no cover crop or other best management practice, that's the nitrate at risk. It might not leach, but it might. It very likely will if it's a sandy site. That's the at-risk nitrogen. And this is the part where it gets pretty scary for the environmental folks in the room, sorry. The orange line is soil nitrate in the top meter. So down here at zero pounds per acre, my background's about 20 pounds per acre of nitrogen left in the soil. All right, my pounds per acre left in the soil is over here on this axis. And that background stays the same all the way up to 100 pounds per acre of nitrogen. So I put 100 pounds per acre of nitrogen on and I've pushed my yield up from about 60 bushels to let's say 130. I got 70 bushels for my 100 pounds of nitrogen so far and I have contributed nothing to the Chesapeake Bay, the inland bays or my groundwater well. I'm doing good. But I'm losing a boatload of money right there. I am not profitable. I don't know what my performance objective is for water quality. What is it, 0.1 milligram per liter of nitrate, 10 parts per million nitrate? Anybody got a number for me? How many, what's that? Let's go with 10. How many pounds per acre in the soil results in 10 parts per million in my well? Now all of a sudden it starts getting pretty doggone fuzzy, right? I don't know what the right rate is for economic until after the season's over. I'm still trying to figure out where I'm at environmentally. It's expensive to get this data. We're not willing to pay for it, so we end up guessing. So there's my economic optimum nitrogen rate. What happened to the slope of that line? Skyrocketing. Before the economic optimum nitrogen rate. So if I want to protect the environment, I've got to be losing a buttload of money down here. And then if I'm fertilizing for max yield, or if that risk has pushed me up 30 pounds higher, so there's max yield. One bushel more, 25 pounds per acre more nitrogen got me one bushel. That's my max yield, but it's not quite as profitable as 205 pounds per acre of nitrogen. But that resulted in an extra 17 pounds per acre of nitrogen. One bushel of grain, and I put 17 extra pounds in the soil. That's probably about another, what, 13 ppm going into the groundwater. And we said 10 ppm was our baseline. We were already past 10 ppm somewhere down here. We put about another 60 pounds of nitrogen in the groundwater just to get to economic optimum. Don't be fooled. You're losing money to protect water quality. So the debate is how do we pay for that? Equip, cover crop programs, phosphorus filters in the ditch, no-till. Is it an external good and the public pays for it? And so there's pushing, that, some of that responsibility has to fall on the farmer because otherwise then we'd be applying 60 pounds more than we need because that economically is the least risky. Nitrogen's cheap. But weather is what's really tripping us up. So our systems aren't good because if we look at the same data, dry year, average year, wet year, that green line right there is your nitrate leaching. Dry year, my max yield was about 50 bushels. Everything I put on that field went into the bay. So irrigation right there is the number one BMP. And then we should start talking about cover crops and some other things. As long as we have ample water, but then there's a discussion about how much water do we have, yada, 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 what's the cost of accessing that water. And then we talk about these broader external factors. So water quality right next door is an external factor to the farm economics. But nitrogen use efficiency increase globally of 1% would be worth $336 million. And that money can be reinvested in developing worlds where they need more food. So this is a human issue, right? 
This is an issue of social justice. In other words, if I'm farming in Sub-Saharan Africa, my fertilizer is limited because you have priced it higher because you can afford it in the United States and I can't afford it here. So if we get 1% increase in NUA in the United States, we're going to see a shift of resources to these areas where they need it to offset starvation. There's these rings like an onion of external factors that influence you know, how we make these decisions. Looking at variability can be useful. This is some data from Kentucky on farm trials. We're doing nitrogen rates from about 160. Ooh, here's my neat toy. We're doing nitrogen rates of 160 to 100 pounds per acre at side dress, actually a little bit less down here somewhere, about 75. We got yield on the vertical axis. And look down here at the low nitrogen rates. Statistically, these top three rates are not different, but look how closely tight they are. My precision is much better at higher nitrogen rates. The right rate was down here somewhere, but that farmer's gonna put this down because of that economic risk. Because in spots in the field, some of his spots in the field look like these two little points down here, or this little point down here. When I, de when I depend on the soil, the soil's a liar. I can't trust the soil. In some spots in my field, I'm gonna lose money. And so I over apply to the whole field to bring those points up spatial precision within the field. We're, we're messing with that now. At the end of the day, the yield fertilizer production function follows the law of diminishing returns. Fixed costs are constant, all that other stuff. Profit occurs when that variable return is greater than the variable cost. In this case, the change in yield over the change in nitrogen rate is greater than the price of nitrogen divided by the price of yield. Money is limited. The most profitable fertilizer rate is when the last dollar spent on fertilizer generates the same dollar in crop values of each of the other inputs. The cost of too little fertilizer is going to be much greater. It's going to sting more than the cost of too much. But we need to fundamentally understand why nitrogen surpluses exist. Weather, spatial variability, economics. But we do need a new mousetrap. If we're going to meet water quality goals, Current best management practices will not do it, I would argue. That's not fact, that's McGrath opinion. But it's an informed opinion, I would argue. Fertilizer technology, I think it's gonna be something we haven't thought of yet. I was out at Case New Holland, they were telling me about, they got little Roombas, where they turn loose in the field and it drives over the weeds, goes down the corn where you just leave it running in your cornfield, takes a picture of that plant, identifies the plant, selects the herbicide from one of the onboard bottles, hits that plant, and you just leave it running all season long, running up and down your roads. How cool is that? It's not economically feasible yet, but it exists. Hybrid corn wasn't considered economically feasible until they developed it, right? It's gonna be some sort of disruptive technology that incorporates fertilizer chemistry, the application equipment, the system by which we make recommendations, how we make that equation, and I believe probably big data and data management across space and time. But we need new research tools to get there. We haven't even talked about plant-to-plant -plant variability. That's what I was up in Chicago, Case New Hanlon, talking about. Back in the 80s, we proved that the right way to manage nitrogen, the spatial resolution you need if you're doing variable rate application, is by plant. Every corn plant has a unique and individual requirement. And we have the ability to predict that requirement. But we have no way to test these mechanisms because we can't even measure yield at that scale. A combine needs hundreds of feet to get an accurate measurement. We can't, we don't have enough manpower to just harvest individual ears. And so if you think about that, how much nitrogen leaching do we have because every plant has a different requirement. With that, that's my big pile of poo. Uh, hopefully you didn't learn anything by accident. And uh, I've got about 30 seconds for questions. Questions? Questions? Yeah, questions. Help a brother out. <laughs>